but it is called Chaye uh, Sarah, the life of Sarah. Uh, it is the only, you know, Abraham doesn't have a Torah portion that's called the life of Abraham. There's no Torah portion in the life of Isaac. There's no Torah portion in the life of Jacob, but there is a Torah portion and there's no Torah portion for the other matriarchs, the life of Rebecca, the life of uh, Rachel or Leah. One matriarch, Sarah, the first one, the founding mother of the Jewish nation, gets a Torah portion named after her. And by the way, there's no Torah portion in the life of Moshe. There's no Torah portion in the life of Aaron. No great Jewish figure gets this title. So it shows you uh, appreciation and honor to Jewish womanhood, the mother of the Jewish nation. And what's amazing is that the very first verse talks not about the life of Sarah, but the passing of Sarah, that Sarah dies at the age of 127 years old. And immediately we go into a very uh, elaborate story that spans the first 20 verses of this week's Torah portion about Abraham purchasing a cave to bury his wife, Sarah. And if you've ever been to the city of Hebron in Israel, you've stood at the cave of the patriarchs, Marat HaMachpelah, which is what is purchased by Abraham in the land of Israel. And not only was Abraham and Sarah buried there, but all the other patriarchs and matriarchs were ultimately buried there with one exception. And that was the matriarch Rachel, because she died on the road and she was buried in the tomb of Rachel. <coughs> now, what's interesting is that, you know, King David uh, built, you know, he, he and his son actually built the temple in Jerusalem. But the first 30 years of King David's life, he reigned in Hebron. Abraham lived in Hebron. Sarah lived in Hebron. Jewish origin starts in Hebron. And I just saw a heartbreaking headline. I don't know where it was, but tragically, I'm sorry to tell you this news, but in Israel, there was a terrorist attack and three Jews were murdered uh, just today. I didn't see the details, but it was somewhere in the West Bank area. And, you know, ironically, our enemies say, oh, this is not your land. And they say that about all of Israel, obviously, but they specifically claim it about the areas over the Green Line, but Hebron is the first location that Jews own land in Israel. And the Torah describes how Abraham paid top dollar to acquire it. So Abraham is now grieving over the loss of his beloved wife, Sarah, who dies. You may think this is odd, but prematurely because she only lived to 127. And you may say 127, that's great. But in those days, people lived longer. Abraham lived to 175. So if you compare 175 to Sarah at 127, it was somewhat prematurely. And Abraham is grieving and mourning. The Torah very clearly says, Vayavro Abraham lespod lesarav lepkosa. In the second verse, it says, Abraham came and eulogized and wept over his beloved wife, Sarah. <clears throat> but you know what the next word after Abraham wept over his wife Sarah is? Verse 3. Vayakam Abraham. Abraham rose up from the face of his dead, his deceased wife. And what does he do? He starts to negotiate with the members of Chait, which was a family, a prominent family in Hebron, to purchase the cave of Machpelah as a befitting burial place for his wife. And the Torah spends 20 verses talking about the purchase of this cave. So obviously it's a very important story and a very important acquisition. And now it's obviously an important acquisition because that is where the Jewish ownership of the land of Israel begins. But ironically, God had told Abraham, I'm going to give this land to your descendants. So listen to what <laughs> Abraham says to the family of Chait. And particularly he says it to Ephron, who is the the head of the family. He says, Ger Bitoshav, he says, an alien and a resident, I am amongst you. Give me a portion of land of this cave. It was a double cave to bury my dead, to bury my wife. Now, you're either a alien or a resident or a citizen. What does it mean I am both? So Rashi explains that he was saying, look, 
I could either enter into this deal as an alien, as a foreigner, and you can charge me full price and I'm happy to pay for the cave to bury my wife. However, if you will deny me the right to purchase it, then I will invoke my right to this land as a Toshav, as a resident. What does that mean? God promised this land to me and my descendants. So I could either act as an alien or as a resident. You choose how you want to deal with me. And we all know the end of the story. Ephron ends up charging him and not just charging him, but overcharging him to purchase this cave. <clears throat> and Abraham buries Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. But Rabbi Salavechik, says something very powerful about these two words. Ger v'toshav. The first Jew, Abraham says to Ephron, I am a resident and an alien. And he says, isn't that the story of the Jewish people in every generation? On the one hand, we're toshavim, we're residents. We're full-fledged citizens. We're Americans, like any other American. But yet, we're always treated like aliens, like foreigners. We're simultaneously residents and aliens and foreigners. And last night we had Ilan Carr speak at the synagogue. Many of you were there. Uh, and Ilan Carr was the former special envoy to combat anti-Semitism. And he spoke about anti-Semitism, obviously. And the whole subject of anti-Semitism, that even though we're citizens, we're Americans, we're treated differently. There's a double standard. And <clears throat> to give one example he gave, which I thought was pretty insightful, he said, everyone knows what Black History Month is, right? You can't miss it. It's in the public schools, it's in the libraries, it's in the billboards, it's everywhere. But he said, did you know that there's actually Jewish History Month? The month of May, which coincides with the day of Yom Atzmut, Israel's Independence Day, for the past 42 years, it didn't start last year, 42 years, I didn't look it up, but I trust them. 42 years, the month of May is Jewish History Month. But guess what? I never heard of it or barely heard of it. You never heard of it, barely heard of it. I mean, the, 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 this Black History Month to talk about what the Black people went through and their contributions and their suffering and everything they endured. And the whole country recognizes it. But Jewish History Month, barely a mention. So there's always this double standard when it comes to Jews. We're residents, but at the same time, we're very much treated like aliens. And that's what Abraham says. And maybe it's intended that way by God. People always say anti-Semitism. Well, there's no excuse for the anti-Semites. As Ilan Carr said last night, it's a spiritual illness, anti-Semitism. It's a sickness, a spiritual sickness. <clears throat> but someone once said something very powerful that resonated with me. He said, the Jewish people have remained Jewish for thousands of years, not despite anti-Semitism, but because of anti-Semitism. Maybe when we get too accepted and too comfortable and too welcomed into the mainstream society, we lose our Jewish identity. And America is a case in point, obviously, where many Jews, because it's overall a very welcoming society, have um, abandoned uh, their Jewish heritage uh, for mainstream American society with assimilation. So going back to the story of Abraham. So the question is, how do we deal with grief? Abraham is grieving for his wife. This is the first story in the Torah about a man losing his beloved wife and having to bury his beloved wife. And what does Abraham do right at after he mourns and cries for her, he rises up. And what does he do? So if you have to summarize this week's Torah portion, three things happen in this week's Torah portion. The first thing is the story of the cave of Machpelah. Abraham buys the first acquisition, the first piece of land, real estate in Israel. 
Now, God had promised Abraham that the land of Israel will be for him and his descendants. But up until this point, he legally does not own anything in the land of Israel. It's only now that he acquires his first piece of land. And of course, from that piece of land, it expands and expands until the whole, entire land of Israel is Abraham's. <clears throat> but Abraham on the promise that God gave him and says, okay, now it's time to buy a piece of real estate in Israel. The second part of the Torah portion, which actually makes up the bulk of the Torah portion, chapter 23 is the cave of Machpelah's acquisition. Ta chapter 24, which by the way, just that you know, is the longest chapter in the entire Torah. It spans 67 verses. There's no Torah for section, no chapter, as long as chapter 24, 67 verses. And go, what does it talk about? Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. It's all about Abraham finding a shidduch for his son, Isaac. Isaac was no youngster, he was 40 years old. And Abraham, we all know the story, sends Eliezer to go to his hometown of Haran to find the girl. <clears throat> and he discovers Rebecca, and we'll get into that story maybe a little later. But the second part of the Torah portion is about the marriage arrangement through the servant of Abraham, Eliezer, for Isaac to find Rebecca. The fact that it's the biggest chapter in the Torah tells you how important love and marriage and uh, marrying off the next generation is in Judaism. What's the third thing that happens at the end of this week's Torah portion? Abraham remarries. And this is a shocker to many people, but he has an additional six children. So when you look at Abraham at this point, he's 137 years old. His wife just died. And God gave him two big promises. Promise number one is the land of Promise number one is you'll have children like the stars in the heaven. Problem number two, uh, promise number two, I'm sorry, is that the land of Israel will be given to those descendants. Now, here we know, here we are, 2022, and we know that both of those promises have been fulfilled. We have a great nation emerge from Abraham, the Jewish people. That's what God told them. A great nation will come from you. And the land of Israel is the Jewish homeland today, 2022. But if you rewind the tape to the moment Sarah died 3,800 years ago, Abraham is grieving for his wife and he must be thinking to himself, what happened to God's promise? God told me I'm going to have a great nation. All I have is one son, Isaac, who's 40 years old and single. And God told me the land of Israel is going to be my inheritance, my children's possession. And what do I have? Nothing. I have to pay top dollar to buy a little cave for my wife to be buried. But what does Abraham do? He rises up from the face of his dead. And he says, okay, now it's time to act. God made these promises, but it doesn't back and expect it to happen by itself. It's a covenant. You know what a covenant is? It's a partnership. God says, I'll do my part. You do your part. But without us doing our part, God's promise will not be fulfilled because it's not like God is saying he's going to do it for us. And therefore, Abraham gets busy. Abraham gets to work, starts buying land in Israel. He starts arranging a marriage for He says, now let's build this future. And it's a very powerful lesson here. You know, when a person goes through a, a, a tragedy, God forbid, a loss, there's two things you can do. <clears throat> you could either focus by looking back on what you lost or you could look forward. Now, there were two people who looked back. Noah, after the flood, looked at the devastation and he got drunk, planted a vineyard and got drunk and nothing became of him because he was so gripped by the spear and sadness over the destruction of the world that he was not able to build a future. And therefore he never becomes a great Jewish leader, even though he saved the world during the flood. And then we had last week, the story of Lot's wife who looks back at the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah as they're being destroyed and turns into a pillar of salt. So by looking back, Noah and Lot's wife became embittered. That's the metaphor of a pillar of salt or became so 
you know, I don't want to diagnose Noah with P, uh, post-traumatic, you know, uh, stress disorder, PTSD, but he gets drunk. He's laying in the, in the tent naked and his children have to cover him up with a blanket. Abraham takes the, the, the Jewish approach. And that is, yes, you weep for your wife, which he does. He eulogizes his wife, but then he rises up in the face of his dad and says, you know how I'm going to overcome this grief? By looking to the future, what remains to be done, what I have to focus on. So it's about hearing the call of the future and having a purpose. You know, there are two great psychiatrists, Freud on the one hand, and then you had Viktor Frankl. Freud is all about looking back at your past. Freudian psychology, right? You go to your therapist and you focus on everything that went wrong in your life and how you got here and all the problems in your childhood and your the appearance and you just dwell on that. <clears throat> Viktor Frankl had something called logotherapy, which is about the future. And, and Viktor Frankl survived the Holocaust. So he, he knew about overcoming grief. And his famous quote is, you could if you have a why, you could overcome any how. If you have a why, you could overcome every. In other words, why are you living? What is your purpose? What are you striving for? What is your goals? What do you want to achieve? If you have a why, then you could overcome everything. And so Abraham focuses on the future. You know, Viktor Frankl said the most important thing that a human being wants and needs is purpose, not pleasure. And so what is my purpose? You know, the worst thing that happens, and this is very sad, a lot of times someone loses their spouse. and after that, they go downhill sometimes because they've lost their will to live. They've lost their future purpose. They feel like, okay, what is my life? You know, what is, what is the, the purpose of my life at this point? But look at what Abraham does. First, he goes and buys the land in Israel. Then he marries off his son. And then he himself remarries and has another family. In other words, he's forward thinking, future thinking. And that's one of the opening messages of this week's Torah portion is that, yes, God made great promises to Abraham, but had Abraham not, someone once said, it was an old person who the older he got, the busier he got. Someone said, you know, usually people slow down when they get old. Why are you getting busier and busier? And the person said, you know, when you start getting older and older, you see the door starting to swing closed. And when you see the door starting to swing closed, you realize you got to work faster because the door is starting to close. So. The Chafetz Chaim once famously said <coughs> that when people write a postcard, I don't know if people write postcards still, but if you go to Paris, you go on a trip to Israel, you say, oh, you go to Florida, you send a postcard to somebody, they still send it, sell them public postcards, I think, right? They have a whole rack of postcards. I don't know how much they're used today, but it used to be a big thing, postcards, right? So when people write postcards, the Chafetz Chaim says they start with very big letters. Halfway through the postcard, they realize they're running out of space and they have a lot to say. So they start making smaller letters. He says, by the end of the postcard, they're cramming these tiny little letters into the postcard. He says, that's the way people live their life. When they're young, ah, I got all the time in the world. Nothing to, to worry about. They, they, they splurge their time. They get a little middle age. Uh oh, middle age. I got to get busy here. Got to you know, compact the time. The end of their life, they're cramming in every little thing. He says, but a smart person, when he starts the postcard, he realizes, listen, this is a finite little postcard. There's only so much space. So I'm not going to waste it with big words. I'm going to start with the appropriate sized words. And the same thing with time. Don't waste your time. When you're young, that's the greatest gift. Use your time. And don't think I have all the time in the world. There's a story that there was once a convention of evil inclinations in heaven. How do we get people to commit sins? So they had all these speakers, these different angels who... It's called the Satan, the Satan, the Yitzhara. One angel gets us, I tell them, and there's no God, and there's no reward, and there's no punishment. Do what you want. Enjoy your life. That's my, my, my way to convince people. The other guy says, I tell them there's a God, but God doesn't care what you do. Do whatever makes you happy. That's what God wants. And the third one says, I tell them there's no heaven and hell. A, when you die, you die. It doesn't matter how you live your life, so enjoy yourself. And then the last angel gets up to speak and he says, I tell them there's a God. I tell them there's heaven and hell. I tell them God wants you to be good. 
But I tell them, what are you worried about? You got plenty of time. You're still young. You have plenty of time to do all the good things. That idea of plenty of time is the mistake. So Abraham at 137 really gets busy in this week's Torah portion. And by marrying off Isaac to Rebekah, they have children. Jacob and Esau, that's where the 12 tribes of Israel come from. By getting Hebron, he got a stakehold in Israel. Now Israel becomes his, his children's inheritance. <clears throat> so that is the focus of this week's Torah portion. But without a doubt, the centerpiece of this week's Torah portion, as I said, which is the largest section of the Torah portion, but actually the largest chapter in the whole Torah, is the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah. Now, anyone who's married or anyone who has children will tell you, no, tell you or tell your children that the number one criteria in marriage that everyone should look for in a spouse is what it says in Perky Avot is the most important quality a person can possess. And that is a lev tov, a good heart. A good heart. You know, Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, when I was young, I admired people who were smart. As I get older, I admire people who have a good heart. I remember once there was a lecturer in our shul for a Friday night dinner talking about marriage. And he said, he did something very cute that I still remember. He said, let me look around this room. There are like 100 people at Shabbat dinner. He says, how many combined years of marriage experience does everyone in this room have combined? I figure 100 people, uh, most of them are married. They're married 20, 30, 40 years. He says, would you say we have 1,000 years of marriage experience in this room? And yeah, we have at least 1,000 years between 100 people in this room. You know, Just a husband and wife, you're married 30 years. You have 30 years experience. Your, your husband or your wife has 30 years. He says, with the thousand years of marriage experience, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> What's more important for a successful marriage? A or B? Is it more important how much the husband and wives agree with one another, see eye to eye with one another? Or is the key to a successful marriage not how much you see eye to eye with each other, but how well you know how to compromise or resolve the differences of your, of your different views and opinions. And it didn't even take a second. Everyone raised their hand and said, it's B. It's not how much you see eye to eye with your spouse. It's how well you resolve the differences between you. How well you're willing to compromise and give for one another, to make each other happy, and so on and so forth. So we all know a good heart is the most important criteria. And so Abraham sends Eliezer to find a girl for Isaac to marry. And here's the famous classical story of the first matchmaker, the first shidduch in Jewish history that's delineated in the Torah because we don't know how Abraham and Sarah met. The first Jewish couple, we, don't, we just says he married her. We don't know. He says his wife, Sarah. We don't know how they, how they got together. <coughs> Here we have exactly how we got together. Abraham sends Eliezer, which is a separate discussion. Why didn't Eliezer go find his own wife? Why is he sending a matchmaker? It wasn't like he was 18 years old. He was 40 years old. You know, and a lot of commentary. Rashi says that Abraham wanted someone from his hometown of Haran. He didn't like the Canaanites. He thought they were, they were idol worshippers of those days. He didn't want to have anything to do with them. They were wicked people. So go back to my hometown. At least the people, they are good people. And Isaac never left Israel. He was the only, you know, there are certain Jews till today <clears throat> who make a point, you know, of never leaving Israel. Have you ever met someone like that? Born in Israel, and they never traveled out of Israel. Not because they can't afford to. You can invite them to come. They know, I don't leave Israel. I'm living my whole life. I'm not leaving Israel for one hour. They won't fly anywhere for vacation. They stay in Israel. What is the paradigm for that? Isaac. Isaac never set foot out of Israel. He was... He was offered as elevation offering, as at the binding of Isaac. He was a different level of holiness. So he had to send a, a matchmaker, Eliezer, who is the faithful, loyal servant of Abraham. And what does he do? He arrives with 10 camels to the city of Haran, and he comes to the well. Now, why 10 camels? He brought a lot of gifts for the future family of the bride and the bride. But he arrives at the well and he says to God, okay, God, I need your help here. You know, when it comes to marriages, you believe in Basharat. Hashem has to work it out. You know, you can't do it yourself. You need some divine intervention to meet 
It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. How do you find your soulmate? So Eliezer says, I'm going to make a test. And God help me do kindness with me and help me find the right girl for my master's son. He says, I'm going to go over to the girls as they come down to the well with the pitchers of water. When I see a girl with a pitcher collecting water, I'll go over and say, listen, can I have a little water? I'm thirsty. I'm, I'm a guest in town. I just arrived. I don't own a pitcher. You know, can I have some of your water? <clears throat> if the girl says, sure, have, have some water. Not the right girl for Isaac. But if the girl says, absolutely, I'll give you some water. But not only that, let me get water for your camels. Because I see you have camels. Now, camels drink a lot of water. Ten camels drink a really a lot of water. He says the girl is going to extend herself to that degree that she's going to offer to get water, not just for me, but for my camels. Oh, this is the girl that's worthy to marry Isaac. And the verse says, barely finished uttering this prayer to God, and there comes Rebecca with her pitcher. He approaches her, and sure enough, Rebecca says the magic words, the answer he was waiting for. He couldn't believe how he got it on the first shot. He says, could I have some more? He says, sure, for you and for your camels. And that's when he knows it's the girl. And then you'll read the whole story on Shabbos or in home, how he says, uh, you know, I'm here on a mission. My master, Abraham, has a son. Uh, and he takes him, she takes him home to give him a place to sleep. And then he tells the, the brother and the father that I'm looking for a match until finally they agree to let Rebecca go and marry Isaac. And then in this Parsha, they actually meet and get married. We have the, the wedding, the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca. But this amazing story teaches us this lesson, that the most important thing is chesed. You know, in Hebrew, we have two words. We have chesed and tzedakah. Chesed is kindness. Tzedakah is charity. What's the difference? So charity is money. Right, you write a check today. You put a credit card in line. Right, you put in your credit card number. That's tzedakah. You know, the synagogue, except on Shabbat, we go around with the tzedakah box. Or maybe in your house, you have a tzedakah box. What is chesed? Chesed is an act of kindness. Like getting water for Elias is an act of chesed. Or visiting the sick is an act of chesed. Or or hosting a guest in your house is an act of chesed. And there's a million acts of chesed. What's interesting is. The Talmud says that chesed is greater than tzedakah in three ways. Why? Says the Talmud. Tzedakah, you do with your money. Chesed, you do with your very body, with your whole being is engaged in the, in the chesed, in the act of kindness. Second of all, tzedakah, you can only give to a poor person. A rich man doesn't need your tzedakah. But chesed, you could do for poor and rich alike. Rich people also get sick and need to be visited in the hospital. Rich people also travel and need a place to stay and have a good meal and be welcome to be amongst friends and guests. Rich people also need help uh, in many different ways. Everyone needs help. Everyone needs chesed. So chesed is not just for the poor. It's for the rich uh, like. And finally, the Talmud says, tzedakah, you can only give to the living. Poor person can benefit from your money. But chesed, kindness, is not just for the living but for the dead if you do something kind let's say you remember somebody who passed away you have a, a prayer you say kaddish for somebody you say yisker for someone you have a memorial service for someone uh, you honor their memory you put up a headstone on their grave there's so many different acts of chesed you could do for a dead person but tzedakah you can't give them anymore tzedakah they don't need so chesed is the highest act of kindness and this is the story abraham was a man of chesed and therefore no wonder that his son wanted to marry a girl like her father a man a girl who personified chesed and the obvious lesson is you know today's day and age people could be swayed to marry people for many different reasons you can marry someone because they're very you can marry someone because they're very attractive the guy's looking for a beautiful girl a girl's looking for a very handsome guy. Uh, he's looking for a, she's looking for a stud or whatever it is, right? Or you can marry someone for their money. Oh, he's a rich guy, successful, whatever. 
It's all very nice. It's all wonderful. But that's not the reason to choose somebody. The only reason that really makes a difference, ultimately, because everything else is temporary and fleeting. The looks will fade and the money can come and go. But their heart, their character, their kindness, their goodness, that you're going to have forever. And therefore, the story Rebecca teaches us what is the most important uh, characteristic trait we should look for. Not even smart. Oh, he's so smart. Smart is nice. It's wonderful. I wish it on everyone that your spouses should be smart. But at the end of the day, if someone's smart, but they're not nice, they're going to use their intelligence to outsmart you, to, to manipulate you, to control you, to work behind your back. They can do your, the, the brain, if it's not fueled by a good heart, if you have a good heart, then your head is thinking how to be good. It's wonderful. But if your heart isn't good, then your head is working only against you. Same thing, oh, good sense of humor. It's wonderful to have a spouse with a good sense of humor, no question. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is chesed, is kindness. And not just ordinary chesed. <clears throat> Eliezer wasn't just looking for a girl who will give him water, a girl who will go above and beyond. And especially for those who love animals, do kindness with animals. Animals are defenseless creatures. And to do kindness for an animal is even more special because it represents kindness for those who cannot help themselves. And a complete stranger. And just to throw in one idea that, you know, one of the things with kindness is that sometimes we make calculations. Someone asks you for an act of kindness. And really the question is, can I help? He asked for help. She asked for help. If I can do it, I'm going to do it. But sometimes the, the brain gets in the way and the brain says, one minute, why do I have to do this for him? Why can't he do it for himself? Why can't he help someone else? Why don't he, you know, he wants money from me. I, you know, let, let, let him uh, go, go get a job. Uh, why didn't he, he needs a place to stay. Why didn't he plan ahead? Why didn't he go make a hotel reservation? Why is he coming out? The brain starts working over time. Rivka could have said, Rebecca could have said, what's wrong with this guy? He's asking me, a woman, to go schlep water for him? You're a big man. You're a, you're a grown adult. Go get your own water. I have to fetch water for you. Like, who do you think I am? And for your camels? But Rebecca didn't make calculations. A man asked for help. He needs water. I'll be happy. Why? Because it's a love of kindness. You know, we chess it as loving kindness. Now, there's two ways to translate. One is loving kindness, kindness done with love. But it's also a love for kindness. You know, you can do kindness like a duty an obligation, a responsibility. Somebody needs help. I got to help them. But there's no love in it. To do it with love is the key. And I'll tell you something I learned today. Uh, I found it really, really beautiful. You have to know a little bit of Hebrew to appreciate it. But it was a, a thought from the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Yosef Yosef Schneerson. And he said like this, take the first four letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bed, Gimel, Dalet. <laughs> he said, Aleph stands for the word Ahava, which means love. Bet stands for the word Bracha, which means blessing. He says, where there's love, it leads to blessings. Love always brings blessings. More love, more blessings. Greater love, greater blessings. Love always leads to Bet. Ava goes to Bracha. He says, Gimel stands for Gava. Gava means haughtiness, arrogance, pride, ego. Gimel is Gava in Hebrew. He says, Dalet, the fourth letter, stands for Dalot, which means poverty or impoverished. When you're arrogant, when you're egotistical, when you're self-centered, when you're haughty, it always makes you impoverished. It doesn't mean financially impoverished. It means it makes you a smaller person. It makes you a weaker person. It makes you a more dependent person, like a poor person. It makes you poor. So, Love leads to bracha. Ava leads to blessing. Gimel, gava, <laughs> leads to dalut, to poverty, to impoverishedness. And all you have to remember is the four, first four letters of the alphabet, and you have a roadmap for life. Always go with love. Love will lead to blessing. If you go with ego, it will lead to impo being impoverished. <clears throat> so Rebecca teaches us what it means to be a kind person. Um, there's another major thought on this week's Torah portion, and that is 
when it talks about Abraham's passing at the end of the Torah portion, we find something similar with Sarah. I'm not going to get into all the details, but we find this when it talks, the two bookends of the Torah portion is the death of Abraham and the death of, the death of Sarah and then the death of Abraham. But I want to read to you what the Torah says about the passing of Abraham. This is at the very end of the Torah portion. I'll just read it in English, okay? Now, these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, 100 years, 70 years, and five years, 175. And here's the verse. And Abraham expired and died at a good old age, mature and content. And he was gathered to his people. In other words, the Torah describes Abraham dying as a content, happy man. Now, did Abraham have an easy life? On a scale from one to ten, how would you rate Abraham's life? I mean, at best, you would give it a five. At best. Think about all the struggles here. First of all, God told him, leave your family behind. His own father wanted to put him to death because he smashed his father's idols. He had to, you know, stand up to his own father. And then he, think of all the stories he had to deal with. He had a quarrel with his nephew, Lot. And then uh, his lot was abducted. His wife was abducted once, twice. He had to go get his wife out of abduction, uh, kidnapped by the kings because she was so beautiful. He suffered infertility. He couldn't have a child until he was 100 years old, right? And then he had problems with his son, Yishmael. Remember, he had to drive away Yishmael. There was family friction between Yishmael and Isaac and Hagar and all the problems. Then as God tells him to sacrifice the son. He has to go sacrifice the son. The last minute, God says, don't sacrifice the son. And then his wife dies at 137. I mean, he didn't have the easiest life. He had a lot of challenges, a lot of hardships, a lot of uh, problems along the way. But yet the Torah says he died happy and content. And the same thing with Sarah in the beginning of the parasha. The rabbis say, based on the terminology, that all the days of her life were good. And the question is, how could that be? And you know, everyone knows this from life, but as a rabbi, I, I speak to a lot of people and, you know, unfortunately, everyone has problems. Everyone has their challenges, sometimes bigger, sometimes lesser. And how do you overcome that? How do you, like Abraham and Sarah, say you had a good life when it wasn't so obviously good? And the answer is that it's only through the eyes of faith. In other words, Abraham and Sarah weren't living for pleasure. They weren't living for enjoyment. They were living for purpose. They had a mission. And as long as they're fulfilling their mission, they felt fulfilled. They felt satisfied. They felt, was it difficult? Yeah, but there was a purpose to it. You know, Edith Eager, who spoke to us once on a Zoom, once made a beautiful, she wrote a book, The Choice, at the age of 90-something. Incredible woman, a survivor of the Holocaust, I think, from Auschwitz. And she said, what's the difference between what's the difference between victim victimization and victimhood, I think it was. Um, I'm not recalling the exact words. She did it really beautifully, but the point is that Sometimes you're a victim, right? Something happens to you. Someone does something bad to you, right? And you're the victim. No question. You suffer. But there's a difference between being a victim and victimhood. Victimhood is where you adopt an, a mindset of victimhood. In other words, the way she said it was, is victim is when something happens to you from external forces. Joseph, for example, right? He's the best example. He's thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. Is he an innocent victim? Yeah. Or Edith Eager, she went through the Holocaust. Was she an innocent victim of the Nazis' evil? Of course she was. She lost her relative. She suffered in the Holocaust, right? But she said, I'm not going to become a victimhood. I'm not going to adopt that as, woe unto me, I'm a victim. Why? Because here's what she said. Victimization is when it's perpetrated against me from external sources. Victimhood is where I internally define myself as a victim, see myself as a victim. So Abraham suffered a lot of hardships, but he never, and this is true of the Jewish people, this is actually very powerful about the Jewish people. The Jewish people have 
been the victims of much hate and evil in the world throughout all the generations. But we never became, we never adopted victimhood. We never saw ourselves, we never started seeing ourselves as that being our identity that we're victims. We transcended that. And Abraham and Sarah teach us how to do that. Yes, a life full of challenges, but <clears throat> my life has a meaning, my life has a purpose. I have faith in God that there's a reason for what I'm enduring, what I'm experiencing, what I'm going through. And that's the way you could overcome the being a victim and not being victimized. Or to put it in a different term, I heard someone say, what's the difference between pain and suffering? Sounds like synonymous, pain and suffering. People say it together, but it's very different. It says, and this particular speaker, I remember Rabbi Shays Tal put it this way. He says, in the middle of the night, you're going to get a drink from the refrigerator and your little kids left the Legos on the kitchen floor without putting them away. And you're walking and you put your foot down on a Lego piece, right? Or you stub your toe in the coffee table, right? Ah! It kills, right? That's pain, he said. He says, 10 minutes later, the pain is gone from putting your foot down on the Lego or stubbing your toe in the coffee table. The pain is gone. It's 10 minutes later, you're back in bed. The victim is the one who's still suffering, the one who has victimhood, because he's still saying, those kids, they always leave their toys around. Why do these bad things always happen to me? I'm always the guy who gets, oh, you're going on and you you're cooking up more anger and more frustration and more this, and you carry it for who knows how long. <clears throat> now that's a silly example with a Lego, but in a serious way, everyone goes through something. But the question is, you know, someone said, I'm holding this bottle of water. Okay. How much does this water weigh? It weighs, I don't know, a quarter of a pound, let's say, right? Is this water heavy? Nah, not at all. What's if I hold it like this for an hour? If I hold this water for an hour, is my hand gonna start getting tired? Oh yeah. How about if I hold it for three hours? Now my hand is gonna start really killing. If I hold it for five hours, my hand is gonna become numb, right? So what's the point of the story? The point is, it's not how heavy it is. It's how long you hold on to it. We all have to carry certain heaviness in life. But if you hold it for a minute and then you put it down and you move on, it doesn't paralyze you. But if all you do is hold on to the things that hurt you 24 seven, even if it's a little nothing, eventually it's gonna weigh you down. Eventually it's gonna make you feel numb and paralyzed. So <clears throat> yes, nobody could get through life without pain, but suffering is what you do internally to yourself. And that's the story. Abraham and Sarah had a good life. They had a fulfilled life. They had a happy life. Did they have an easy life? No. And by the way, every Friday night or on special occasions, we wish our children, may God make you like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and I. We do it on the Friday night dinner. What, are we wishing our kids that uh, they shouldn't have children till they're 90 and 99? Are we wishing our kids that their wives should be kidnapped, God forbid? Are we wishing our kids that you know, the, God forbid, all the hardships that they went through. What do you mean God should make you like Isaac, Jacob, and uh, Isaac and Jacob, and Rebecca? I mean, they had a very hard life. Why don't we choose people who had a very easy life? And the answer is because we're not wishing our kids an easy life. We're wishing our kids a meaningful life, a life that produces great results, that accomplishes great things, that has a great legacy. Will there be hardships along the way? Of course there will be. That's part of it. But what are you focused on? Are you focused on the pain or are you focused on the purpose and the meaning? And that's really the story of Abraham and Sarah and the story of the Jewish people until today. There's so much more to say about the Torah portion. So since we only have about five, six minutes, I'm going to make it very brief so you could dig deeper on your own, perhaps. One is the amazing reconciliation. Abraham remarries Hagar, his first wife. And with that, Ishmael, the son who was sent away, gets back into the picture. And at Abraham's, Sarah, uh, at Abraham's funeral, who buries him? Isaac and Ishmael. And believe it or not, believe it or not, our rabbis point out that 
Ishmael showed respect to Isaac, knowing that the greater honor was given to Isaac. Ishmael realized that Isaac is the true progeny and heir to the spiritual legacy of Abraham. So Abraham reconciles with his old wife, Hagar, and with his estranged child, which is a very deep and powerful story, which, again, each one of these stories has tremendous emotional power to it, but one of the greatest tragedies, unfortunately, and you should never know from this, but again, as a rabbi, I deal with a lot of people, is when children become estranged from their parents and sever the relationship. And that means that the parents don't have a relationship with the children or the grandchildren. And it's a very painful situation. And in a way, it's worth, worse than the death of a child. Because God forbid, if a child dies, you still have a relationship with your grandchildren. But here, the child's alive, but it's as though they're dead because they have nothing to do with you. And you don't even have a relationship with your own grandchildren. And, it, and the cases I've seen, it's not that the parents are evil people. If the people, if parents are evil people, that's a different story. It's over unbelievable petty things that lead to big things. And suddenly there's anger and they won't talk to each other. And it's really heartbreaking. This is a story of Ishmael was sent out of the house with Hagar. And now they're back together. Abraham brings his family back together. And that's just an amazing story. It's also Isaac and Ishmael, Jews and Arabs, like we're seeing with the Abraham Accords now, right? Where Jews are working together versus against each other in the beginning between Yishmael and Isaac. One other powerful thing we must talk about before we close the class, and that is prayer. When Okay, so first of all, if you've been to a Jewish wedding, which you've all been to it, a traditional wedding, before the groom goes to the chuppah, he goes to the bride and lowers the veil on the bride. And a Jewish bride goes to the chuppah with a veil. Where does that come from? This week's Torah portion, as Isaac comes and meets Rebecca for the first time, she sees him and covers her face with a veil, which is a sign of modesty. You know, like, like when you blush sometimes, right? Out of modesty, you blush on certain circumstances, right? You see somebody that you're attracted to or whatever, you could blush if somebody says something flattering. Isaac sees Rebecca, she covers her face out of modesty. So the Jewish woman goes with the veil representing what Rebecca did. This is the first marriage discussed at length. In Yiddish, it's called the Badekin ceremony, the veiling ceremony, very beautiful ceremony at a wedding, as you know. But what's powerful is when, when he sees her, she veils her face. And when she sees him, what does she see him doing? And the verse says, Isaac went out to converse in the field. And that's when Rebecca was coming with Eliezer on the camels, and they saw each other. And Rashi famously and classically says, what does it mean that he went to converse in the field. Who was he going to converse with? Our rabbi said he was conversing with God. He went to pray. So when does, you know, when you get married, so you ask yourself, okay, when was the first time you saw your husband or wife? When was the first time you met? When you spotted them, right? Imagine a, a girl who the first time she sees her future husband is she's in shul and she looks over the machitza and she sees a man, a, a guy davening. He's davening with such fervor. She's, I'm so attracted to this guy. Look at the way he talks to God. with such feeling, right? Well, the first time Rebecca saw Isaac was praying in the field. But without too much elaboration, we know that there are three daily prayers, morning, shacharit, our mincha, afternoon, and arvit. It says that Isaac went out to pray before evening, afternoon time. So rabbis say, Abraham, we learned this last week with Sodom and Gomorrah, prayed in the morning. Isaac prayed in the afternoon. And Jacob, we're going to find next week when he runs away. Uh, not next week. <coughs> um, two weeks from now. When he runs away, he sleeps and he has the ladder, the dream with the angel. It was at night when he encounters God. So it's interesting. Abraham woke up in the morning and prayed to God. That's prayer. Isaac converses with God. Jacob encounters God. Morning, afternoon, evening. And it's very symbolic. Abraham is the founder. Morning, a new religion, Judaism. Isaac is the afternoon. Afternoon is the continuity of the morning. It's not an entity unto itself, really. It's the continuation of the morning. Jacob represents the Jews 
and the future of Jewish history, which encounters many dark moments, like Jacob running away from his brother, being chased by his enemy, and he encounters God. And so too, all of us must experience all three types of prayer every day. On the one hand, there are times we set out to pray, formal ritualistic prayer. We open the prayer book and we say the words in the prayer book. But then there's the Isaac form of prayer. It's more like meditation. It's like you're having a conversation with God in your mind. It's, it's a human conversation, but with God. God, what should I do about the situation? I have a, a dilemma. I need help in this. It's not scripted like the prayer book. And then you have the third moment, which is maybe the most powerful of all, which is encountering God. When you least expect God, suddenly God shows up in your life. You're going through some difficult situation. All of a sudden, the answer comes. The, the, the salvation arrives. You weren't even asking God for his help. You weren't expecting it. It came out of nowhere in an unpredictable, unexpected, unplanned way. And it's like, I it's like you know, you encounter somebody, you're walking in the street, and you're bumping, ah, what are you doing here? I didn't know you were in town. What's going on? Like, it's like a surprise. Sometimes God surprises you. And that's the most delightful one sometimes. Because when you're asking for help and it comes, that's wonderful. But when you were just consumed with your worries or your challenges and suddenly the answer arose out of nowhere. Wow. God answered me, as the prophet says, even before I called out, God already answered me. God heard my thoughts, so to speak, and sent the salvation in a in a in an unpredictable way that I didn't even anticipate or dream would happen. It just the answer came, the solution arrived, the resolution presented itself, the blessing just came on a silver platter when I wasn't even or least expecting it to arrive. And that's the three forms of prayer represented by the three patriarchs. And just that you know, <clears throat> and this is very relevant this time of year, it says from all the three prayers, what's the holiest prayer? The afternoon prayer, Mincha. Why? Because morning prayer is morning. Before you go to work, you say your prayers. Evening prayers, you come home, Whenever you, you have a whole night to say the prayers. Mincha is right in the middle of the afternoon. You have to stop what you're doing and tear yourself away from a busy day to go pray. And why do I say at this point? Because in New York, this time of year, it gets dark like 5 o'clock or 4.30 or 4.45. So Mincha has to be done during the day. And something very beautiful, and this happens in all over Manhattan and other religious communities, Religious Jews need a minion right in the middle of the workday. So I've never experienced this in Manhattan so much, but people from Manhattan will tell you. But I did experience once I was working in medical supplies in Brooklyn for a short time. And basically every day during the winter, two o'clock, the office would stop. Imagine a big company with, I don't know, 50, 60 workers, but most of them were religious people. And business, buying, selling, you know, servicing hundreds of nursing homes and hospitals, calling, right? But two o'clock, everyone would stop, put on their hat, jacket, the men, go into a, the conference room, and for 15 minutes, pray the mincha afternoon. And the company stopped doing business for 15 minutes. And you know what? The phone calls will wait. We got to talk to God now. We have to pray. And in Manhattan, it's well known that there's hundreds of minions and office buildings all over where hundreds of people get together. In the middle of the day, leave their desk, go to pray mincha. And that's why it's the greatest prayer, because it has to be done during the day and requires you to interrupt whatever it is you're doing. And as we know, in everything in life and everything in Judaism, the the more effort you have to put into something, the greater is the reward. So wishing everyone a great day. Thank you for joining. And we look forward to seeing you all uh, very, very soon on Shabbat. And uh, have a wonderful day or lunch and learn tomorrow. All the best. Bye. Thank you.